And here we go, our last example on the p-value approach for hypothesis testing for proportions. So here we have a survey where 45% of the respondents stated that they talked to their pets. A veterinarian believed that this result was inaccurate, so she randomly selected 150 pet owners and discovered 63 of them talked to their pets. Does the veterinarian have enough evidence to say that the proportion of pet owners that talk to their pets is different than the 45% that was stated in the survey? Use the alpha equals 0 0.01 level of significance. So jumping in here, 45% of respondents talk to their pets. She randomly selected 150 pet owners. 63 of them spoke to their pets. Proportion. Oop, enough evidence. Again, enough evidence, sufficient evidence tells me that I'm doing a hypothesis test. Different from 45%. And alpha equals 0 0.01 level of significance. So 45%, 150, 63, and 0 0.01. So that's going to be our alpha. It even told us alpha equals 0 0.01. She sampled 150 pet owners. 63 are the number of pet owners that talk to their pets. And 45% is the percent that she does not agree with, the percent that she is comparing this to. So that's going to be our population proportion. So our null and our alternative... Our null starts with HO, P equals 45% as a decimal. Looking back over here as to what I wrote down for what P equaled from the problem. And HA, the alternative, what the veterinarian believes. She believes she wants to see if P is different from 0.45. So that's going to be the not equal to. She doesn't know if it's less than or greater than. She just wants to know if it's different. We're going to do the test statistic by hand one more time. Again, if the problem doesn't tell you to do it by hand, you don't have to do it by hand. You are more than welcome to use Excel, but I want to make sure we understand what's going on. Our formula, Z equals P hat minus P over the square root of P times 1 minus P divided by N. So I have P, N, X, alpha. I do not have a P hat. So I'm going to find P hat by taking x and dividing it by n, woo, n got a little bit crazy. So 63 over 150, and I'm gonna get a repeating decimal, I think. Oh, nope, I don't. If I did, you are okay to round the repeating decimal on p hat. But I didn't. I got just 0. 0.42. So 0. 0.42 minus 0. 0.45 divided by the square root of 0. 0.45 times 1 minus 0. 0.45 over 150. So the top is negative 0 0.03. And the bottom, again, we get a long repeating decimal 
like we've had before. We don't want to round that. So we get point oh, nope, zero, mm, negative zero point seven three eight five. And we'll do the p-value by hand. And two-tailed tests are really weird about the p-value. So when we do the p-value on a two-tailed test, because you are not committing to whether it is less than or greater than, when you calculate the p-value, you have to look at the possibility that this z-score could have been positive or negative and then less than that or greater than that. So it's weird. Um, you basically get punished on your p-value for not committing to less than or greater than. There are advantages to, not, to doing not equal to, but there are disadvantages as well. And this is where the disadvantages are. So if this is my curve, I'm going to label negative 0 0.7385, which, no, nope, that's, that's too close. I'm going to put that right there. This is negative 0 0.7385. And then I want to find everything less than that. But... I also have to consider, because I did a two-tailed test, positive 0.7385 and everything greater than that. So I have shaded the two outer tails of the normal curve. That's why it's called a two-tailed test. And we did not point that out at the beginning. This is our two-tailed test when we have the not equal to sign. There are several ways you could find this probability. The easiest way is whatever you get for the z-score, whether it's positive or negative. I'm going to go into norm.s.dist. And I'm going to plug in the negative of the z-score. Whoopsies. And then true. So essentially, I am finding this area. I'm always going to find that less than area. So I'm going to find what that area is right now. Um... Negative point seven three eight five comma true, and I get my blue pen back zero point two three zero one, and then I need from point seven three eight five and above. But if you recall, the normal distribution is symmetric, meaning if I fold it in half, it's the same on either side. And because I have the negative and the positive of the z-scores, what I can do at this point with this two-tailed test and the way that this all works out is I can take this 0 0.2301 and multiply it by 2 to get that other area. So my p-value is 0 0.4602. Uh-oh. 
I'm sorry, I was trying to get ahead and not have to insert a page later. And it's not gonna let me do what I want to do. Okay. So two-tailed test, you have to consider less than the negative of the z-score and greater than the positive of whatever z-score you get. So if you get a positive z-score when you do the test statistic, then you have to add the negative z-score on your curve. So you have to have two z-scores, and instead of looking at the between, we're looking at everything outside of the between. And the easiest way to find the p-value is take the negative z-score, find the area less than that, and then multiply that by 2. Or let, it, let Excel do that work for you. We love Excel. It's, it makes us so happy. So our null hypothesis says P is equal to 0.5. And then this guy needs to say is not equal to, so P is not equal to 0.45. Our N is 150. X is 63. Again, alpha, you don't have to put that in, but it's good practice. So we type everything in, we get a Z naught of negative 0 0.7385, and we get a P value of 0 0.4602. And it's so much faster. Again, this Z critical line, you have two values here, you can ignore those because I'm not teaching that method, it's there for other instructors if they do still teach that method. If you wanna learn that method, please come to office hours. So then I'm gonna to have to squeeze this because it's not letting me add a page without messing everything up. We're gonna do our conclusion and our interpretation. And this is not part one. I'm sorry, I didn't change that. Interpretation. I think I spelled that wrong. Interpret. Nope, maybe not. So our conclusion, again, we want to know, is the p-value too small? Is the p-value... Oh, let me move that. Less than the alpha. Is p-value too little and we compare that to alpha to determine what is too little um so is 0 0.4602 less than 0 0.01 nope so if it is not low you do not reject the null. I, I, I don't have room to, to write. I'm sorry. And our interpretation of what this not rejecting means. So we do not reject the null. And this is the interpretation where it's a lot better to use the interpretation where, where you're saying whether you have or do not have the sufficient, sufficient evidence or enough evidence, unlike in the first example where I did that first one and I was like, ooh, this one actually gets kind of weird. This is where it gets weird. So we do not reject the null hypothesis. And conclude that there is not enough evidence to claim 
that the proportion of pet owners that talk to their pets differs or is different from differs from 45%. So we do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is not enough evidence to claim that the proportion of pet owners that talk to their pets differs from 45%. And I would just like to point out, no, it was not less than, so we did not reject the null and we did not have enough evidence. So there is a bit of a pattern as far as that conclusion and interpretation as far as what it means. So we were trying to show that this was true. We could not. So we have, so we, we don't want to say that this is true. So all we're going to say is that this is not true. That's what we're saying. And that is the last.